This is a long-awaited organic one chem lab exam review. I uh, created, there we go, some, uh, this, this review to sh as close as I can get to uh, what you're going to see on the final. Start out with is uh, naming uh, pieces of glassware. Let's start out with uh, the one on the left. What you want to know is the name of the piece of the glassware and what it's used for. So in this one is called a spelling. Okay, but uh, maybe, but um, it should be fine. Anyway, this different from, of course, from a Hirsch funnel. A Hirsch funnel. This is a Buchner funnel because it has these uh, square edges here. It's meant for larger things. A Hirsch funnel looks sort of like this, so that's a little different. It has a little tiny uh, frit in the bottom that holds the a tiny piece of filter paper. It fits in the same way. And uh, that's a Hirsch funnel. This can have a number of names, uh, but the I think the one that's given in the uh, in Canvas is the. Uh, It's distinguished from a Erlenmeyer flask. This is a heavy walled ED vacuum flask. It's distinguishable from the Erlenmeyer flask because it has a side arm on it. Um, here we have an apparatus. It's for distillation, of course. That's the purpose of it. And the um, type of distillation, well, it's either simple or fractional. In this case, it's fractional because we have a a fractionation column right there. This is a condenser. Thermometer, of course. And this is a vacuum adapter. Let me draw a line arrow to it. This would be a round bottom, actually. This is, would be is a, looks like a um, rotary evaporator flask, but round bottom flask is fine, good enough. Is here and here. I think that's pretty much everything. Of course, you can recognize a hot plate. And stir. But uh, so the other piece is here. And this is the separatory. Funnel. It's used for immiscible liquids. 
So separatory funnel used for separating it in immiscible liquids. Another way you might call this is liquid-liquid extraction. I would accept either uh, use of the separatory funnel. Okay, so let's move on. More, a little harder stuff. So here we're dealing with a melting point problem. And you notice that the melting points, literature melting points, are relatively close to each other. And the measured melting points are also quite close to each other. The unknown could be actually any of these because the uncertainty in the melting point, maybe it's a little imp here, is within the range of all of these measured melting points. And um, if we look at the unknown here, we, now it's mixed with something. If it's mixed with something, it'll be more here. So we look at the unknown plus salicylic acid. It's 160 to 163. Salicylic acid is 158 to 153. That's not bad. If we look at it for naphthoic acid, now we have 140 to 155. Notice how broad that became, where naphthoic acid alone is 157 to 165. Higher range and sharper. Uh, and then this is a very broad melting point range for unknown plus acetaminophen compared to the 165 plus 1 to 170 that you might have measured here. So the one that didn't change much was the salicylic acid. SIG 160 to 163 is in the same range of 158 to 153, in fact. Uh, and 162, chances are, if you were doing this unknown, maybe you were in too much of a hurry to melt it. That's why it went so high. But still, 162 is within this range. So what is the unknown? The only one it can be, you have to cross this one off and this one off. The only one it can be is salicylic acid. And of course, I could have made that by adjusting the numbers of the unknown plus compound made it any one of these. But salicylic acid is the one that these this data indicates. OK, keep going. So this is one that uh, is new. I just put it in because there is a problem a lot like this on the uh, test and everyone seems to get it wrong, so I thought I should give you a review of it. Um, first of all, you, when we're looking at the organic, getting a name from a compound, you look at the main structure. Of course, that's a cyclopentane. But now we have two groups, and if you start at one, you'd go one, two, and three. So it's a one, three dimethyl cyclopentane. Dash. One three dimethyl cyclopentane. Now, that's not. There are actually f three varieties of one three dimethyl cyclopentane. Uh, one with the uh, methyl groups on the same side, and two with the methyl groups on opposite sides. You could simply call it trans, but that would only narrow it down to two. So the most accurate way to name this is using kahn engel prelog stereochemistry. If you look at each of these, we have CH two CH two. 
CH3. So these are both CH2, so they're tied. You go out one more, it's CH3. You go out one more here, it's carbon with one hydrogen. So this is one, two, three. Draw a circle, and we've got hydrogen down is R. If we look at this one, we have one, two, three, that's counterclockwise. But since methyl is down, hydrogen must be up. So then you therefore use the backwards rule and that makes this one also R. So it's R comma R parentheses dash 1,3 dimethyl cyclopentane. And that's a completely unambiguous and accurate name for this compound. So let's start to look, take a look at this. This is 2S, 3S butane, 2,3 diol. And uh, we recognize the longest chain as butane, so I'm just going to draw a butane chain there and work from there. It would be okay to draw a Fischer projection as well. Um, let's draw it both ways. One, two, three, four. There is butane. And if it's S, let's say, let's look at this. Now, if I put the ethyl, the oxygen up, that would be one, two, three. If the hydrogen is back, that would make this R. So that means I have to put this oxygen down. And then the hydrogen would be up, so you'd use the backwards rule. That would give you 1, 2, 3, R. Now, here be the same thing. If we put the oxygen here, it's 1, 2, 3. If it were going up, it would be R. Sorry, 1, 2, 3, backwards rule is S. That's coming out of the plane. Now, if we go down here, the oxygen is out. That would make it 1, 2, 3, R. We don't want S, R. We want S, S. So that means the oxygen here has to be going back too. And the hydrogen again coming out. So we'd use the backwards rule. 1, let's do hydrogen there. 1, 2, 3. Looks like R, but backwards rule again says S. 2S, 3S. And there you have it. Okay, so remember, just take it piece by piece. Don't don't get uh, flustered. So the next one is a compound. It looks pretty complicated, and you might say, oh my god, I can't do that. But start out looking at the longest chain. We have one, two, three, four, five. So that's pentine. And if we look at this alcohol, we go 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3. That OH is smack dab in the middle. So either way, it's a 3 pen, uh, uh, pent. It's a pent 1, 9, 3, all. And let's just put the, oh, shoot. I'll go back and do the, the Fisher projection of this. I forgot. If you, the ein starts at the start, so this is pent one, three, all. There's one stereo center here, and it's this one. Now notice that it's not the lowest priority. The lowest priority would be the methyl group. 
so it's not the lowest priority that goes back. So you can sort of imagine yourself looking, turning this slightly so you're looking down this bond here. So you have the CH3 right at you. This would give you 1, 2, and 3, which is counterclockwise. Since you'd be using the backwards rule, you would do R, pent 1, I, and 3, all. Okay, let me go back to this. Fisher projection. Now, remember Fisher projections are the backwards rule. So on this one, we if we put the oxygen out here, we'd be going 1, 2, 3 clockwise with the backwards rule prevailing. So that's how we would do it. And remember, what we do is we flip this one up, so that would be coming out, and the other way to do it, this is a hydrogen here. If we do it on this side, it would be 1, 2, 3. Our, and, of course, backwards rule would make that an S as well. So we want this oxygen on the other side, like that, and then the hydrogen here. I also know that this is not meso, because their two chiral centers are the same. If the oxygen on the second one were on this side where the hydrogen is, you draw, could draw a plane of symmetry right across that thing and you'd have a meso compound. Okay. So let's look at this one. 2-chlorobut, E2-chlorobut 2-ene. And um, now we have to figure out where our double bonds are and uh, or, you know where which way the double bond is going so if I were to let me draw one thing first one two three so this is butte two ene and if I draw this chlorine here now we have one two and since this is a hydrogen, it's 1, 2. Notice that 1s are on the same side, so that is not E. This is actually Z. So we don't want that. What we want to do is then we draw it this way. And we do CL like that. So now I have 1, 2 and 1, 2. 2 with the hydrogen here, that gives you E. Okay, that's the naming. If you can do this, you can do the ones on the exam. GC, draw a chromatogram for the first fraction of the distillation of 1 to 1 cyclohexane toluene. Um, doesn't say fractional or simple, but you know that either way, Cyclohexane is going to come out first, so if the timeline starts here, we have our, our, our injection, maybe here. A little over, you would, so you have your trace coming along. A little over, you might get a little air peak. If the toluene, if the cyclohexane is boiling off, is coming out of the GC first, because it's lower boiling, it's also going to come out of the still first for the same reasons. So that and that means that you're going to get mostly cyclohexane and a little bit of toluene. So essentially, you would get something like, oops, well it doesn't go backwards, but just hard to control this pen. There, like that, and then sometime later, a little bit later, you get another peak for the toluene, like that. This is. cyclohexane, and this is toluene. Okay, let's keep going. Oops, forward. Describe the distillation. What makes a good crystallization solvent? Well, good crystallization solvent Uh, 
uh, is uh, uh, so do you want it to be whatever your compound to be soluble in hot solvent insoluble in cold solvent so it's not a good solvent it's a mediocre solvent for your stuff too good you won't get it out and if you have a solvent that's not at all a good solvent then of course you'll never get it to go into solution no matter how much you heat it um, so if you're looking at this um, in terms of polarity number of these compounds from uh, least polar to most polar well first of all look at the different types of interactions this one really doesn't have much of an interaction except for London dispersion forces and uh, so the interactions here and the uh, that means essentially no dipole moment anywhere on this thing in this case you have two opportunities for hydrogen bonding one dipole moment here and of course there'd be a dipole moment across the molecule as well because of these oxygens and then here you have just a dipole moment across this way but no hydrogen bonding so in terms of polar this would be this would be least polar so I'll call that one this would be two and this would be three and which would dissolve it the best well if we look at acetone let's set these into polarity also acetone oh, hexane is just a straight chain so that's one in terms of lowest polarity this would be two and water of course is three so water would be a good solvent for this one maybe not a good recrystallization solvent hexane would be a good solvent for this one and acetone would be a good solvent for that one so if you're describing the process of recrystallization if you want to look at the complete process assuming you have insoluble impurities and so forth um, first of all of course you would be if you've already selected the solvent then you of course move on to step two and step two would become step one and that is hot dissolve hot if you have insoluble impurities you would hot filter then cool and then collect it by vacuum filtration and you're done so if we're looking at this this one uh, we have two different compounds notice that this is a carboxylic acid and this is has a lone pair here so this is a base so if you're thinking of something reacting with NaOH it's going to uh, in this will react with NaOH to make the salt and it would uh, tend to go into the water phase now let's see where the water phase is dichloromethane has two chlorines so it's going to be more dense than water it's going to be in the bottom
CH2Cl2, and the bottom layer would be caffeine. Notice the caffeine will not react with NaOH because NaOH is a base, caffeine is a base. It will NaOH will react with the acid, so the top layer would be the water aqueous phase, that's ibuprofen. Sorry. I'll just say sodium salt because it's not going to be this. It's going to be get rid of that, put a negative charge there, and that's what you got when you react these. The bottom layer will be caffeine just in its original form. Okay, that's good. Let's keep going. Stereoisomers, so here's a, a, a math problem for stereoisomers. 5 grams, so uh, 1 phenylethanamine was dissolved in ethanol, 5 grams and 20 mils, and the optical rotation was measured in a 2DM cell. The optical rotation was found to be negative 12.0 degrees. What is the, find the specific rotation, E, E, and percent S and R isomers. So let's start out with the specific rotation. Alpha equals observed over concentration times L, path length. So let's take a look. 5 grams and 20 mils, so it would be, um, well, we can just take this, we'd take negative 12.0 degree and 1 over 5 gram over 20 ml equals 20 ml over 5 grams. So that's what I'm going to do here. Okay. Point oh, 12, oh, I just see what I did. 12.0, I'll put the degree there, times 20 over 5 times 2. So let's see what we've got. 5 times 2 is 10. 20 over 2 is simple, uh, over 10 is 2. So that's equal to negative 12 times 2, which is equal to negative 24 degree ml per gram dm. Now, I didn't write it here because, I guess, out of carelessness, but usually in ethanol, um, the uh, specific rotation of pure material, if I were giving this problem to you, I'd, of course, have to give you this value. Alpha here equals 30 degree ml per gram dm. So now we just take that and take 24 degree ml over per gram dm over 30 degree ml per gram dm. And of course all at times 100 percent. Of course all the units cancel so I've got 24 over 30 and I could pull out my calculator or Excel but if we look at 24 that's uh, 6 times 4 and this is 6 times 5, which is 4 over 5 equals uh, 0 0.8 
times 100 equals 80 percent. Awesome. Let's keep going. Oh shoot! Yeah. Now we got to got to do the um, got to do the uh, percent concentration. This is 80 percent E E. To get the percent concentration, it's 100. And actually, I forgot, this is negative 24 over negative 30, but same difference. 100 plus EE over 2 equals 180 over 2 equals 90% S minus 10% percent R plus done okay let's keep on moving rate law oh what fun so we have molarity here acetone at a certain molarity and uh, the um, iodine at a certain molarity. Let's see what we're doing here. Here we're multiplying the iodine by 3 and other than that these two are the same. And notice the rate is pretty much the same which shows iodine is zero order. So we look at this one we're multiplying this by 2 this, uh, what is it, HCl by 2 and if we look at this, well, from 4.17 to 8.34, that's double. So rate doubles. So that means it has to be K times HCl To the first power and let's take a look at the other one uh, which would be doubling the concentration of acetone so if we go from 1 to 3 everything is the same except for acetone doubles and if you look at this 8.04 is pretty close to double as well so that means acetone to the first power. So now all we need to do is uh, um, put in is fill in here and we say So 0 0.66 molar minus 0 0.166 molar times K equals 4.17 times 10 to the negative sixth. And that would be, um, let's, we know everything except K, so we take these and divide over by 0 0.666 times 0 0.166 that gets rid of these guys and we've got K and what would this be um, the rate is in uh, moles per liter second and um, this is 
moles per liter squared so let's see moles per liter squared times k equals So that means k has to be liters squared per mole seconds. That's mole and mole. Mole, it has to be liters squared per mole seconds. That way, when you multiply it by moles squared, moles per liter squared, you get moles per second. So let's see. Um, I'm not going to do that one in my head, so let's uh, see if I can move over to a... Uh, let's go over here and open an Excel file. I guess I forgot to open that one earlier. and just put in these numbers. Make it a little bigger so you can see what I'm doing. And we would put equals 4.17 times 10 the negative sixth over parentheses 0 0.666 times 0 0.166 shift close parentheses and that ought to do it so the answer is 3.7 Let's see how many. It looks like we're three sig figs. So 3.77, 3 3.77 3 times 10 to the negative fifth. I think that's it. Yep. 3.77 times 10 to the negative fifth liter squared per mole second. And that's... 3.77 times 10 to the negative fifth liters per mole second. Okay. Drawing mechanisms. So you'll need to know the mechanisms for the different uh, reactions. Elimination of bromine from 2-bromohexane with sodium methoxide. So 2-bromohexane would look like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 2-bromo means we've got Br there. And we have to have a um, hydrogen here. And these have to be coplanar. So that means that, let's say, depending on the, uh, say this is, has Hydrogen coming out, that methyl group's going back, that's going down. That means this is going up, and let's say, depending on the, this is going out, and the other hydrogen would. So you have CH3O minus, and the arrow goes toward the hydrogen. And then from the bond to the hydrogen to form that double bond, breaking the bond all at once. And the E2, that product would be predominantly that. Now LDA is going to do it a little bit differently. 
we look at LDA, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, let's say, let's go ahead and say we have the hydrogen, the and here I have something like this and notice the hydrogen and the bromine are actually coplanar so I'd have This is my bulky base. It's going to grab here. I have the arrow again going toward the hydrogen. The arrow from these electrons going to form that double bond, and then this bond breaking and going on to the bromine. I forgot to put his plus. And this is coarse. something like that. Plus, so sorry. And this is, of course, It's in there. Draw the mechanism for the elimination of water from 2-hexanol with sulfuric acid. So, if we want to do this, it's a multi-step mechanism. So first, let's draw 2-hexanol. Don't worry about the stereochemistry here because there is no requirement for conformations or anything like that. Sulfuric acid is going to be, if it's in water, it's H3O plus. And of course, this oxygen grabs the hydrogen, yanks it from the hydronium. That's the first mechanism. Second step, this thing takes off, so you end up with, that could pop back on, so I'll draw it in uh, equilibrium. And now, it's going to, since this is an equilibrium process, it's ultimately going to go Markov, and, or it's going to go Zaitsev. So this is a hydrogen here. And you, the species taking this will probably be water. It's the most abundant base present. That flows into the positive charge, and you get... You'll probably get it. You'd get a mixture of cis and trans, but I'm just showing the cis, the trans because that would be the predominant form. Okay, let's see. SN1, SN2. Arrange these in order of increasing activity of sulf hydrogen sulfide in acetone. Hydrogen sulfide is a good nucleophile. Acetone is a polar protic solvent, so this is SN2. And now we're looking at things being not very blocked. Increasing reactivity. Well, what's going to be the slowest? This is probably going to be uh, the slowest, so I'll put that first. Now, if we look at this, we've got a... Uh, um, somewhat blocked primary center. Here we have a secondary center, and here we have a primary. 
So your secondary center will probably be next. Or sorry, your blocked primary will be next. Uh, it's what, increasing, yeah. Your secondary center is next slowest, so that's A. And the next slowest would be this blocked one, B. And finally, the fastest of all of these would be the primary, which is D, C, A, B, D. Now, silver nitrate, you're talking about stability of a carbocation. And here you're probably looking at, um, with this one, you would have to form, you would basically be forming, breaking two bonds to form a tertiary carbocation. This would immediately form a tertiary. This would have to form a primary, and this would form a secondary. So with the um, idea of a hydride shift here, I would re I would say that probably the slow well the slowest of course is going to be one, two, three. Br, that's well let's just do it. Uh, that's D. And then we're looking at the uh, intermediate, which would be uh, between these two. This can form a tertiary carbocation. It just takes a little bit more energy to do it. I would say that B would be actually next because of that hydride shift. A would be next because it's secondary. Oh, this is increasing. Sorry. Vice versa. D. A is next slowest from D. I keep thinking decreasing. So D is slowest. A would be next making a secondary center. This could make a tertiary center, so it's going to be next, but it'd have to go through two steps, basically two simultaneous reactions, a hydrolysis accompanied by a hydride shift. And then this doesn't have to do anything but fall off, so C would be the fastest, D-A-B-C. So that's it. Um, if you can do all of this stuff, you can do a, uh, the exam without a problem. Best of luck. And uh, see you on Wednesday.